Hi, my name is Chris Fowler, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we know that you've been here and been blessed. Thank you and God bless. It's common for leaders to feel insecure in their positions. There's all kinds of things that go along with that, and there's the, the different kinds of theories of why people sometimes don't feel like they're the leaders that they're supposed to be, and, and there's something that uh, they call the imposter syndrome, which I have heard explained like seven different ways. Anything from where you just don't feel qualified to be in the position you are in leading, um, that's a very common one with pastors. Some people say that imposter leadership is kind of a, a different story where what you're actually doing is over, kind of over leading um, to, to deal with your insecurities. So Dan Ryland has four steps. He's a, a pastor. He has four steps for dealing with insecurity uh, for leaders in general but he said it's especially true within the church. And the first one is not to despise your insecurity. That if you are a leader and you are a little bit insecure about being a leader, that what you really ought to do is embrace it. Be secure in your insecurity. That's what he would tell you that it's something that actually is part of what almost every leader is experiencing and that is just one of the things that you, you should do. The second thing he says is that it's really good to take a risk and talk about it. I'm not always afraid to say that these are my insecurities as a leader or these are the areas where I know I'm not the best in, in my leadership skills. And, 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 you know, if you want to talk to me about it, make an appointment. We can chat. You can point out 10 new things that I don't already know or maybe remind me of some I've forgotten. Third, he says, identify the most common triggers. So in, in other words, there's probably something that if you have insecurities that you know or you can identify that these things cause the insecurities. If you send me an anonymous email or letter, for example, sometimes that will trigger some insecurities for me. But knowing that uh, actually helps. And by the way, if it's unsigned, I get to go, ha, 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 ignore it, throw it away. Because if you didn't have the guts to sign it, you, anyway. <laughs> Finally, he says, you have to remember who you are in Christ. That whatever you are doing, Jesus has instituted it, you in it. He is the one who restores the broken, the insecure, and everything that we try to hide. He is the one that ultimately changes all of that. Now, why would I bring that up on a, on a Sunday morning in the middle of church, and, and even though I had a staff meeting a little earlier to tell you what, how next Saturday was going to go so that you'd be prepared when you came to work? Service, yes, but anyway. You are a leader, whether you want to admit it, whether you want to own it, whether you want to believe it, you are a leader. There is not a person today, generally speaking, that isn't leading somebody. That there isn't somebody who's looking at and saying, this is something that I am looking at. That this is, this is someone who I want to follow or somebody that I want to be like. Or I suppose the opposite could be true. Somebody I don't want to be like, kind of an anti-follower. But at the very essence, leader is simply having somebody who follows you. So if you have children, or if you've ever had children, you probably know that your children at some point start to look and see what are the things that I want to copy. They say that, you know, people copying you is the best form of flattery, right? <laughs> Usually. Whether we want to admit it or not, there are other people who are following whatever advice we give, whatever direction we give, whatever pathway we offer, what in, whatever inf inspiration we might give. If somebody is, is listening to your advice, you're leading them. If someone is hearing what you have to say about Jesus, you're leading them. 
You are a leader. So when we talk about Saul, who is king over Israel and Judah, and uh, he is the leader, for one, he had been appointed and anointed by God initially, and he has been given the position. He is in the role of leader. So he is leading, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And so God's people would have been looking to Saul and expecting Saul to provide them all the things a good king would provide. Just like we do. We count on our government to help make sure we are prosperous and safe. Okay. Hopefully you're not fully counting on your government to keep you safe and prosperous. But we look somewhere. Where do we find our security? Now, uh, our hope is where? Some of you were a little slow on that one. (laughs) But when we begin to look for, for the real purpose of those things, when we begin to look for God, Saul was a representative of God. He was God's king. He was God's chosen one. And so he should have been providing all of these things to Israel. But we also know that he was disobedient and that God took the anointing from him. My question for us this morning is how does a humble entry cause the insecurity of a king? And we've been talking about David. We're going to talk about David a little bit more. We're going to talk about the next step in the chapter of David's life and his becoming king and what happens and what's going on. But, but I want you to really notice a, a bunch of things in today's story, and we'll kind of wrap it up at the end. And so if the question makes no sense to you now, it will later. First off, let's go back, that David is the Hakaton. We remember what that means, right? He's the runt. He's the youngest and the smallest. Uh, he isn't the king of Israel, but he has been anointed by Samuel to be the next king. We also know that he is glowing with health and good-looking, right? He's been given an honored place in the king's court where he plays the lyre and Saul just absolutely adores him because there's this evil spirit that comes and attacks Saul when the lyre is being played. That evil spirit goes away. Saul is comforted. He's happy again. All is well in his world. And so he, the, the scripture tells us that Saul falls basically in love with David and, and gives him this honored place in the court. Then we know that David comes in and he uses his faith because God is with David. And he uses his faith. And last week we talked a little bit about that story that's so unfamiliar to us of David and Goliath and talked about how he gives this bold speech and this bold prediction that he's just going to have no problems. And, and of course, the Philistine giant Goliath uh, goes down with just one stone. And, and it's just an interesting sort of story. So the next thing that happens, and we're not going to read these particular passages, but I want to make sure we're all up to date, is that there are some behind-the-scenes actions that are preparing the way for David to become the king. Now, you and I need to make sure we're keeping this all kind of, you know, in in check. Why is David where he goes? He's not in Saul's court because he's now trying to become king. God anointed him of no choice of his own. In fact, he was the last of Jesse's sons to be brought. He wasn't standing there going, oh, pick me, pick me. It was like, well, there's one more. Okay, this is the one God has chosen. He gets into Saul's court, not because he says, gee, I want to I infiltrate the palace, but because somebody in Saul's court says, hey, I know what will solve your problem and what will soothe your evil spirit. One of the things that happens is that Saul, in essence, adopts David as his son. Now, if you were to begin reading at the beginning of chapter 18, what the scripture is going to tell you is that Saul doesn't let David go home from this point forward and instead basically brings him in as a son. 
that Saul still loves David, still is very interested in David. There's all kinds of things. And chapter 18, verse 2 says, Saul kept David with him. There's a second thing that goes on, though, and that is that in the midst of sort of being adopted as a son, we, we kind of talked a little bit about Jonathan, and, and we get to the point at the beginning of chapter 18 where you see so very clearly that Jonathan accepts David, not just accepts him, but the scripture says that they basically become like of the same soul, of the same heart, of the same mind. And not only does that happen, but Jonathan hands over his symbols of royalty to David. So basically, that's where you find yourself and you see what's going on in, in all of these sorts of things. Now, what would it mean for Jonathan to give all of his royal clothes, his, his robe, his tunic, his belt, his sword, and all of those things to David? What it would mean is that Jonathan essentially recognizes that David is going to be the next king and is voluntarily giving up his rights by giving these items to David. So in other words, it's Jonathan who's really made it clear in this story that as David is getting so close to the royal family that he's essentially like an adopted son in which Jonathan has said, brother, you be the next king because I can see that God is with you. See, Jonathan plays a very important role in this whole story. It's important for us to make sure that we're paying close attention to everything that's going on. Now, if you could imagine, what would it be like if you have Jonathan in the own king's house kind of looking out and going, I know who the next king's going to be when, when dad's not king anymore. It's going to be David. What would happen if that were to maybe spread throughout the entire community? Great things would go on, right? That's where we get to today's passage. 1 Samuel 18, 5 through 16 says this. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out of all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. This pleased Saul very much. Oh, no. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house, and while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him, and he gave him a command over a thousand men, and David led the troops in their campaigns. And everything he did, he did with great success, because the Lord was with him. When Saul, Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he led them in their campaign. There's some trouble brewing. The townspeople had begun to praise David in a greater position than Saul. Now, if you are the leader, I don't know that there's anything that will make you more insecure than when people start looking at one of your underlings and going, that is the greatest right there. 
the king, he's pretty awesome, and we're welcoming him back into town like we should. But, but look at David, the king, he has slain thousands. But David, tens of thousands. That's a little bit of a strike to the ego. I don't care who you are. Oh, sure, Saul has slain thousands, but David, his tens of thousands, he is the healthy, good-looking runt. And they like him better, apparently, because they're out here singing and dancing to welcome me home, and they're giving him more credit than they're giving me. Could all of this just be because of that little battle in the valley between Ezekiah and Soko that we talked about last week? Is it just this one Philistine and, and the fact that God was restored, essentially, that, that the Philistine who kept being referred to as the one who was defying God has been dealt with in that entire army along with him? Or is there more to what we know or to what we have seen. I thought about this for a little bit, and I, I remembered last week when we were talking about Goliath being seen or seeing David as just sort of this unequal, uh, just almost like, why did you send this good-looking runt to fight me? He's going to be so easy for me to kill. Uh, I probably just need to growl at him, and he'll probably have a heart attack and fall over. He's an unequal adversary. And then Saul sees David, who is somebody who was a friend, who was somebody who brought comfort, who was somebody who, who now has been able to, to get rid of an enemy. And now he's feeling threatened by David. Hmm. It's a difficult thing. Uh, he, the scripture tells us that he becomes angry, that people are crediting David with more success. But I got to tell you something, I think most of us would be the same way. Most of us would probably be like, wait, you like him, but really? Like, I'm, I'm still king. Hello, I have the crown. As the king, I could have his head taken off. You really want to play this game? In fact, the scripture doesn't even mess with this at all. The scripture comes right out and says it. What more could he get? The kingdom? I mean, he's already got everybody just feeding out of his hand. Look at all the women. They're out dancing to me, but going, oh, look, David, fluttery eyes. Oh, look, there's King Saul. He's slain thousands. Oh, look, there's David. Fluttery eyes, tens of thousands. He's so dreamy, too. It seems like this is a turning point where Saul's relationship with David changes from love to fear. That instead of Saul seeing David and seeing one who he loves, he sees David as one who is to be uh, fearful of, to be avoided, to be, to be careful about. And to send out to the front lines, maybe. Like David would later do, but we're not there yet. Saul's feelings as David plays the liar change from being comforted to feelings of aggression. Now imagine if normally you have David there and he's playing some nice soft music and, and you're just sitting there and, and you're feeling comforted and relaxed. And, and, and I could almost imagine, you know, like the king sitting there. Now the scripture doesn't exactly say this, so don't, you know, take this as, as gospel truth. But 
that he's sitting back on his bed and there's those servants who have the the palm fronds who are, you know, fanning him, and, and he's being fed little chocolates or whatever his favorite treat was, and, 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 and there's this wonderful thing, and for, for whatever reason, at this moment in time, he's sitting there, and he's prophesying, and he is not being comforted, and he realizes he has a, a, a spear in his hand and goes, I think I'll just kill him. I think there's something weird about that. Like if we were going to be watching the action scene of the next movie where there's like a shootout, would you expect this calm liar harp music going on in the background? Hmm. Scripture says that Saul attempts to pin David to the wall, which is a polite way of saying Saul tries to kill David. It's basically what it says. Saul tried to kill David, and, and basically, he's going crazy. Now, we know, because we are reading this, and, and the scripture makes it absolutely clear, that the issue at hand is that the location of God's presence has left Saul and has become on David that Saul sees that David is getting all of this glory. He sees that David has all of these things going for him. And basically what he realizes is that God has left me. I'm no longer having the success that God once was giving me. And he has now put that on David. And rather than going to God and saying, hey, Lord, I'm not sure what happened, but obviously I messed something up. And so can you, like, I don't know, put some of that presence back over here? He goes to kill. The author tells us in verse 12 that Saul recognized that the Lord was with David and not himself. So Saul does the one thing that he knows how to do, which is what a lot of us probably would do. He decides to send David away to lead some troops. Get rid of him. I won't see him anymore. He'll be out providing all the security. And you know what? What could possibly go wrong? Nothing, right? Uh, Of course, because David finds great success and then brings even greater fear to Saul each and every step of the way. I mean, think about it. That's what we're being told, that, that David and everything that he's doing because God is with him, because of that, he is getting even more success, which in then only increases what Saul is suffering through. It's an interesting sort of issue to be faced with. And the author consistently credits David's success. The Lord was with him. Why was he such great out on the battlefield? The Lord was with him. Why is everything there? The Lord was with him. Now, I want you to notice something. There is no description of how David comes to this, this success other than the Lord was with him. It doesn't say that David, while he was out commanding these troops, was this great status, uh, or strategic, yeah, he had good strategy. (laughs) He's awesome, right? They don't say that. It just says he went out and there was success in everything that he did. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And if the Lord is giving you your strategy, you're not going to have any problems. There's another thing I want you to make sure you understand. We never hear what David is thinking through any of this. I read you this long thing of scripture, and I told you about the first parts of chapter 18. There's no dialogue that where David has anything to say about it. There's nothing that says, and David felt wonderful about this. Nothing said that David was fearful or that David was concerned. In fact, all it says is David eludes the, the spear twice. And then Saul says, oh, you better get out of here. Go, go command a bunch of troops. Because otherwise I'm going to keep throwing spears at you and I'm going to be even more angry because you keep dodging them. Yep. So Saul is trying to get rid of a problem. And what we see is that in the end, Israel and Judah continue to grow fondly of David 
as their leader. Did you catch that? Did you see it? Verse 16, all Israel and Judea loved David. He led them in their campaigns. All Israel and all Judah loved him because he was their leader. He has not yet been formally named king but he is already their leader because God is with him. How does a humble entry cause the insecurity of a king? Well, I think there's a lot of ways. But a humble entry causes insecurity when one is outside of God's presence. If you are in the center of what God wants you to do and you are being obedient, you don't care who God sends up on your side to work alongside of you. You wouldn't give a a moment's notice to realize that God is working and you're right where God wants you to be and and you're doing everything that God wants you to do, but then you have a, a partner who is also doing those very same sorts of things and that together you would be unstoppable in God's eyes. Thought about this. We've been focusing on David, but it's true of so many of the stories that we would look at. And, and really, if we want to stop and think about it, it's also true of our own lives. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in a church when somebody says, hey, uh, there's somebody that's been in charge and I'm going to use women's ministries because we don't really have a strong, like, this is the women's ministries leader here. But some churches, they've had one, and that person has been in the job since 1902, and is not interested in welcoming anybody who might be interested in coming alongside to help and see what God might do today. And so it's something that I think happens in the church a lot. I think sometimes people try to speak truth into our lives, and and rather than seeing them as a partner sent by God to to help us become closer to God, sometimes we're like, yeah, nah-uh. Are we paying attention to what God is doing in our own lives? And I want to remind you of a couple of Bible stories, starting with David, who was sent by God with a calling and with a mission. I want to tell you about another man, another person. Well, he was sent as a baby. His name was Jesus. He was sent by God with a calling and with a mission to help redeem all of humankind. Now, David's going to become the greatest king of Israel. He's going to really kind of do some weird things and mess some things up personally, but, but he's going to be faithful to what God wants him to do most of the time. David gets anointed by Samuel, and God's presence becomes upon him. When David is anointed by Samuel, you remember what the scripture says. It says, and God's presence was with him from that point forward. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, there's this guy named Jesus I've been telling you about, and I don't know if you remember the story, but he gets baptized, and then there is this dove that comes out of heaven, and there's this voice that says, this is my son and who I am well pleased and that dove lands that spirit lands on jesus and the presence of god moves most likely from john the baptist into jesus and we could go this way because i get really excited about this it should have been in the temple but then it gets out to john the baptist now it's being transferred to jesus david makes a humble entry as a future king not from anything that he was doing but because he was walking into town with the king. And the women were out dancing and everybody was praising and, oh, yay, the troops are home. Saul is home. David's home. Look at all the people who are home. And look, Saul, who's killed his, his thousands, and David with his tens of thousands. woo David didn't ask for any of that. He wasn't coming in and saying, hey, everybody, look at me. Look at what I have done. 
Jesus rides into Jerusalem humbly with people praising his name, putting palm branches down, putting cloaks down, and, and riding into Jerusalem and being where that was supposed to take place. Hmm. David makes the current king, King Saul, so insecure that King Saul would like him dead. This guy named Jesus makes the current leaders at the time, the chief priests and the Pharisees, so insecure that they invite him in to have him help with all the ministries. <laughs> they want him dead. See, the issue for us becomes one of God's presence. And it becomes an issue for us. Can we locate God's presence and be secure in where it is? Now, God's presence from Jesus was passed on. And it now resides in those who are Christ followers through the Spirit. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because this is really good news. <laughs> that in other words, the issue for us is do you recognize that God's presence is supposed to be in you? And if as you stand around, you're looking around going, why is that person getting all the credit and I'm getting nothing, then you are not secure in the fact that you are carrying around God's presence. And maybe that's because you've let God's presence wander off. Actually, you wandered off from God's presence, but that's a whole other story. I think that's a problem for us on Palm Sunday. When normally we gather together and we talk about, oh, look, and, you know, Jesus comes and, you know, hey, we have the kids come in. We did it today because it's fun. Have them come in, wave them around. I didn't see anybody get hit. That was kind of a disappointment, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Can we recognize and be secure in God's presence? Is there something making you insecure with your relationship with God? Because he would like to overcome that. He would like to have you be so secure in your relationship with him that there just isn't even a question. And that it's Easter and you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sing praises and you're supposed to invite people. Got a busy week ahead of us. Those of you that haven't marked your calendars yet, on Wednesday, there'll be a dinner and part two of my Israel presentation. I only got through about half of that last week, so come and we'll actually have pictures of Israel this time, or of, of Jerusalem this time. We'll get there, I promise. And I'm not giving myself a time limit this week. If we have to go into seven or so, we'll do it. <laughs> then... Thursday, we have Monday, Thursday. It's a self-guided sort of communion time. If you've never done it with us before, um, you just come. Usually I give you a little devotional you go through. You take communion and you leave. And it's very meaningful. And then Friday night will be Good Friday service right here in this room at 6.30. Saturday morning, you know what your assignment is. Next Sunday morning, we have breakfast, and we are going to celebrate a risen Savior. <laughs> if there's anything making you insecure about your relationship with God, this is the week to get that right. God loves you so much. He sent his son to die for you. Second thing I'd say is that a humble entry causes insecurity when the king chooses avoidance over following God's presence. In other words, what I'm saying is that Saul sent God's presence out of the palace because he was jealous of it rather than trying to follow God's presence wherever it may go. Hmm. I'm curious what might have happened if Saul had realized that God's presence had departed him and instead of just trying to avoid it, he tried to follow it. Because I'm telling you, I know some Christians who God's presence was on them, 
And when it seemed like God's presence was no longer there, they now avoid it rather than step into it and live into it. We got to be careful about that. I wonder what would have happened if the chief priests and the Pharisees had said, you know what, I'm not so sure God's presence is with us anymore, but God's presence does seem to be with this crazy guy who's standing in front of us named Jesus. Maybe we need to give him the time of day and figure out what he has to say to us, but no, they didn't do that either. I think I've timed out on this thing. I'm wondering, do we become too comfortable with believing that we somehow are the keepers or the controllers of God? Where we get to decide how God is going to work in the world, and when he doesn't, and it looks like he's working through somebody else in a more powerful way, we get fearful and jealous. You see, we should be able to boldly proclaim the gospel message, knowing that God's presence is in us, and it doesn't matter if God's presence is also in everybody else around us. It doesn't matter if somebody starts singing praises. Oh, the people of Desert Grace, they had an Easter egg hunt with thousands, and and the people at the other church, they had an Easter egg hunt with their tens of thousands. Awesome. That means tens of thousands plus have been connected to Jesus. Are you in God's presence? I mean, now you're in church. You should be. But I've said this before a time or two. I'm going to say it again real quick for you. This room is just a room. It's special because we meet here, but other than that, it's just a room. It's built with sticks and concrete and carpet and chairs. and The magic happens when you all bring God's presence into it. That's when things really just get fired up. So are you in God's presence? Because if you are, you're in it now. You'll be in it when you walk out that door. When you go have lunch, you'll be still in God's presence. And, and when you take your afternoon nap, God's presence will still be upon you. And when you wake up this evening, God's presence will be there. When you go to sleep tonight, guess who goes to sleep, you know, with who you go to sleep with whose presence among you? Not to be creepy or anything. <laughs> you wake up in the morning, who's there? God. And on and on and on. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we give you praise for your presence in our lives. You are a God who is great, who is holy, and who comes humbly, and Lord, help us to see you when you come alongside, when we are too busy feeling like we need to control how you interact with our world. Help us to recognize when we are outside of your presence. Help us to recognize when we're outside of your will. Help us to recognize when we're walking away from you and and wondering where you've gone. But especially, Lord, I just ask that you would speak to us fresh and anew in this coming week, that this next week would not just be going through the motions, but it would be a week of just absolute power in your name. We love you. We thank you. We look forward to what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the little bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in the person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928 305-1132 for more information.